We're out. That's it. We're gone. We're gone. That's it. Daybreak, Tuesday the 26th of April 2005. Anywhere but Tasmania, Australia, it's just another day. But here, it's day zero, the beginning of the 14th running of Targa Tasmania, the ultimate tarmac rally. From across the country and across the globe, 252 teams have gathered, world beaters and weekend warriors, all with the same goal, make it to the finish six days and 2,000 kilometres away, in the fastest possible time. Grab the ribbon, Greg. Course is open. The journey begins at Launceston's Country Club Resort. If anyone who says they start this about butterflies tells big fibs, this is number 12 for us, and um, the strange feeling still comes over you when you drive through the first time. But once you do the first. Couple of, couple of stages, it all comes back and you just enjoy it. Yeah, we've been here since Saturday morning and it's sort of uh, finally finally here. And just really trying to soak in as much as I can of the whole event. And then I guess when it comes to getting behind the wheel, there's really only two people that are important and that's uh, you know, yourself and your navigator and just communicating well and just getting through a stage uh, safely and quickly if this, that's possible at the same time. I'd like to, uh, to win the event and would like to be in the top ten at the very least. I don't know how tough the opposition are. You, you look at some of the cars that are around here, these Lamborghinis and the Porsches, and uh, they're fantastic cars. And then I know how hard it is to compete against Jim on a racetrack. I love this event. I think it's one of the best in the world. And uh, to, to finally be in a car that's got the, the chance of winning um, is something I've been looking for for a long time. So looking forward to it, and I just uh, I hope we're there at the end. I still enjoy the track work, don't get me wrong, but if I had to do one event a year, it would be one of these uh, Tarsiel type rallies. So they're really, really good. Targa is a rally in the proper sense, made up of transport and competition stages. Penalties are awarded for failing to complete competition stages within the given base time. When we get to the Targa stage, we stop, we check in, we put our helmets on, the roads are closed by the police and we go and we run as fast as we can over that section of road. We get a time out, and at the end of it we get a time in, and that's the time that you've done over the stage. We start 30 second intervals, so we very rarely catch a car. Now and again we do, but uh, just a great just a great concept, and it's, it's, it's the best motorsport you can be in. Cars are also handicapped according to age and specification. The aim is a level playing field. The event begins with a prologue stage around the streets of Georgetown, the mouth of the Tamer River. A four and a half kilometre, one time only qualifying shot. A big crowd lines the streets of Georgetown, hoping for a taste of the action. And as always, the target teams oblige. Stephen Code souped up 71 Monaro sideways more often than not. Robert Gambino's elegant Ferrari 308 is the first casualty of the prologue. The end, swift and spectacular. He said he could smell burning. And then I looked in the mirror and yeah, we had fire, lots of fire. And the whole back of the car was covered in gulf of flame, so it's just unlucky, but we want to get back out there tomorrow. Quickest of the classics is Len and Gail Catlin in a 69 Boss Mustang, just two tenths ahead of Victorian rookie Michael Conway in an escort, with Bill Pye's 74 911 a second further back. Italy's exotic Lamborghini has launched its most serious challenge for the event, with the V10 all-wheel drive Gallardo making its international competition debut. But it was a shaky start for one of the modern competition's hot favourites. 
Thank you. Okay, we know we're here. Yeah, it's alright. That's good. But to be honest, we'd never run the car over rough roads all that, and I knew it was going to get air, and I didn't know how much air, and, and when we landed, I just was carrying too much speed to stop. Nine right. The second of the Team Seven Lamborghini left. entries is in the hands of PGA golfer Stuart Appleby in his motorsport debut. Keep it going. Off the gas. Well done. Holy s***. <laughs> Welcome to Tiger. Holy mother of <laughs> Do you see how much air we got across that road? <laughs> a time Holy of 3 minutes, 33 oh, seconds, 47th Holy. overall, placing him well inside the cut. Seven-time winner Jim Richards is campaigning a new car for the 05 event, a two-wheel drive Porsche GT3, a car suited to dry conditions, a car perfect for Georgetown. You know, as always, it's just a, a bit of a warm-up, you might say, and get the brakes better in, but we try hard, you know, we, we like to try and beat everyone else but, uh, like everyone does so Richard's posting a time of 3.11 quickest by more than a second Queenslander Tony Quinn is next best his four wheel drive 9.11 would be a serious all weather contender Victorian husband and wife team Jeff and Nerida Beeble third fastest in a Nissan GTR and while the top guns compare notes the rest of the field take aim at their nearest opponent Targa is comprised of four separate competitions with more categories within each comp. No matter what the car or skill level, there's always someone to beat. The award for the slowest prologue time without serious incident going to John Felder in a 1930 Oakland 8. Covering the stage in a leisurely five minutes and nine seconds. An average speed of 52 kilometres per hour. We go basically for the trophy times because this car is not capable of achieving the base times that the car behind me is. So we basically go for trophy times and if I was going for base times, I wouldn't be getting through. <laughs> of competition and it's an early start as the field is flagged away from the centre of Launceston. The first few competition stages are relatively easy. The base times are high and just about every car clean sheets. It's the afternoon stages that everyone is watching. It's the first indication of which cars are going to vie for outright honours in each competition. Day one begins on the northern outskirts of Launceston. Three easy morning stages bring the field to Devonport. It, along with Sheffield, are the longest and hardest stages of the day. And the first stage is where all crews will drop time. For Paul Stokel and navigator Peter Roberts, the morning has been a chance to get to know their brand new, untested Lamborghini. Right up, right up. I thought that was, well, that was me, mate. I'm, yep. I need to wake up. Yep. Seven, to seven. The car was nice on the flying stuff, um, good power, no complaints. It's too early to sort of tell how, how hard it's going to be to, to run at the pace that these front guys are doing, but uh, we're certainly in a good shot, I think. No stranger to handling expensive machinery in close quarters, Stokel is the reigning Australian Nations Cup champion. The former Tasmanian snaring back-to-back -back titles at the wheel of the heavier and more powerful Lamborghini Diablo GTR. The Gallardo is yet to reveal its true potential. As the base times come down, the incident rate goes up. Matthew Charlwood giving himself a moment in Moriarty. Then finishing the job on Devonport. Tiger action hots up at the crowd favourite Moriarty hairpin, catching out several unsuspecting teams. Stuart Appleby is having to nurse the clutch of his Lamborghini off the line. Despite the challenge, he's picked up 15 places for the day, gaining confidence and momentum. Um, I'm listening to calls now, they're starting to come at me. And they're I'm coming. To, yeah, that was getting in. That 
clutch. I've got to stop that clutch. Oh, smell it? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I didn't mean to do that. I'm not trying to rip off the line. Virgin Blue co-founder Rob Sherrard was encountering turbulence, his Porsche shaking itself to pieces. And five right. The headlight, I think. <laughs> it was the headlight. Was it? Yep. Uh -huh. See, we've gone that fast, the car's falling apart. For reigning classic champions Nick Ellis and Tracy Williams in the Blue Gum Escort, the afternoon stages highlight a raft of challenges, all stepping up to take their title. The hunter becomes the hunter. Yeah, very happy with today. Uh, navigator got stuck into me early, told me I was driving like an uh, old woman early. So uh, we pulled the finger out and uh, we, we're, we're reasonably happy with today. We're hoping we're going to be somewhere near the top sort of 10 or 15. Day one ends with the street stage of Longford, a northern Midlands town rich in convict and colonial heritage and a town with a peerless motorsport pedigree. In the 50s and 60s, Longford thrilled to the sound of the Australian Grand Prix. Today, it belongs to Target. <laughs> Base time is high and everyone is putting on a show. Could be gravel on the exit of the three ride. This is three left. Brilliant. At day's end, New South Welshman Bill Pye has forged a 28 second lead in the Shannon's Classic competition. Victorian Michael Conway is second, Ian Smith in an Alfa Romeo third. Defending champs Nick Ellis and Tracy Williams are fifth, 54 seconds off the pace. In drivetravel.com modern, locals Jason and John White driving a Nissan GTR blitzed the day, only dropping time on one stage. Yeah, we didn't think we could sort of um, go that well, but like we've been, we've been a bit hard on the tyres, just sort of backing her into corners and um, going as hard as we could. It's a 16 second buffer back to seven time winners Jim Richards and Barry Oliver. We had uh, no, no problems really, just you know, good clean run, just, just dropped a bit of time, but you know, that's part of the deal. The second further back, Queenslander Tony Quinn rounds out the top three. Paul Stokel has the Gallardo well placed in fourth just 18 seconds off the lead. But we're not far off the pace, you know, we, we, we were quicker than some towards the end and as soon as we get onto some flat roads, I think down the east coast, the, the car will be brilliant. Touring car veteran and Targa rookie Tony Longhurst is in 18th place, almost two minutes down, beginning to come to terms with just what lies ahead. Hard old day, we're down a minute and a half or so. Um, I'm amazed at the pace of the top guys, so I think I should have done a few of the wreckies. The car's going good. Um, <laughs> We've still got a long way to go though, haven't we? So to the Delta Hydraulics leaderboard at day's end and in the Shannon's Classic Comp, Bill Pye is enjoying a 28 second buffer ahead of Michael Conway with Ian Morris six seconds further back. In drivetravel.com modern, white and white are 16 seconds ahead of Richards and Oliver with Tony Quinn and Keith Wen another second back. Paul Stokel has the Lambo handily placed in fourth, 18 seconds off the lead. For one target competitor, taking part in this year's event means passing up the chance to compete against the best in the world for huge sums of money. Stuart Appleby is in World Golf's top 20. He's also a self-confessed redhead. I'm a petrol head, I've got to confess. I don't, I don't think there's any uh, anyone out there doesn't like the, the drive of adrenaline and certainly the, the rush of driving a car 
uh, smoothly or actually getting better at it. Um, yeah, I'm just addicted to it. I've been like that since I was a kid on the farm, racing my dad's Massey Ferguson around, so it's been with me for 15, 20 years now. It's not my living, I know what my living is, and I'll, and I'll leave this for the, the fun on the weekend type stuff. So what are the synergies between driving a golf ball and driving a $400,000 Lamborghini? Rhythm, uh, very much to get your rhythm. Um, now I understand what it's like when you know, you, you teach an amateur golfer, you try and give them three or four lessons in you know, five minutes and it's total confusion. Not that I was getting lessons, but you've got so much information to download. You've got corners coming up at you, you know, 160, 100 and 200 k's an hour, and you're trying to feel that and then match the call, and sometimes around a bit of a blind corner. Now, it's, it's, it takes a lot of balls and a bit of commitment, but I'm really just trying to get smooth, and the smoother I get, just the more I relax and the more things will come to me. So a lot of days to build, but the days are getting tougher, so I'll really have to keep my wits. Navigator Peter Barry is along for the ride and trying to keep his rookie driver out of trouble and out of the tree. Here's your five, then we're turning five left. He is actually improving every day. Um, I think from day one we were uh, just finding out what the car could do and uh, Maybe the car was uh, telling us where it was going. Certainly day two, we've started to tell, the stewards started to tell the car where it should go. The sidling stage is first up on day two, 14 kilometres of twists and turns with a high speed straight in the middle. It's high quality target fare. Day under his belt, Paul Stokel is beginning to settle in. His Lamborghini, the quickest car over the sidling stage, now just four seconds off the outright lead. Flying the finish, go hard, and it is eight left at the end. Right back, right off. That's a red. Nice, great ride. Great ride. Yeah, this, this side of the this side of the, the state suits us. Yeah, nice smooth roads and the car's been fantastic and we've been on it today. We're really good. It's not Porsche country anymore, it's Lambo country. <laughs> Circuit racer Tony Longhurst is taking a little longer to find his rallying feet. He and navigator Michael Devere struggling to get the teamwork going. Now what? Uh, five and a half. Now what? Come on. Uh, uh, four and a half coming into L2. Pair manages the 16th at this time. Tony Queen is second fastest, Richards third. Jason White has to be content with the sixth quickest time, giving up 13 seconds on the stage. After the sidling, day two continues to snake its way through the winding, mountainous roads of the northeast. Crews will drop time on each of the six morning stages. After lunch, it's a turn south to Cranbrook, Triabunna and Grass Tree Hill before finishing the day in Hobart. Classic leader Bill Pye has lost two seconds over the morning stages to the chasing escort of Michael Conway. Dry roads help the Porsche maintain its lead, but the gap is down to only 26 seconds. Oh, pretty successful, I think. We've gone along well. We haven't had any problems. So. Got a little escort uh, chasing you there, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be a bit of a worry if it rains, I think. He might give us a bit of trouble in the wet. But, um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to keep in front of him. But he's going well. Running third in historic, Graham and Pat Kent have had their hands full. <laughs> historic leader John Lawson struck mechanical trouble in the Amilcar Grand Sport rectified the problem between stages without penalty. Not an option for Queenslander Russ Kempnich. His Porsche was running seventh before the Welbra Pass stage. That got uh, horribly long in the uh, right two just down the road. Uh, got caught out by the treacherous uh, Tasmanian moss and we uh, just slipped wide and touched the bank. Two years running now, Kempnich has taken his Porsche off-road on the morning of day two. Classic competition's defending champ Nick Ellis has slipped back to eighth, running out of fuel during the St Mary's stage.
Paul Stokel's hot pace continues, winning five of the six morning stages. By lunch, an 18-second deficit has turned into a 15-second lead. Jim Richards remains the constant, holding on to his second place and increasing his margin over third-placed Tony Quinn. Overall, I think the car is still you know, the best Porsche to have on the event other than the servo. What, what's ideal for you? What, what do you ideally want? Ideal for us is probably second and third gear, windy as anything. Um, I suppose, you know, any road service other than wet. Jason White slips from first to fourth. He's lost 50 seconds to Stokel over the morning stages. The Stokel Lambo's going well. Um, we always expected it to, but um, there's talk of a bit of rain uh, a little bit later on, and his uh, tyre choice is one thing that he did not have for the event, so um, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, there'll be a bit of rain about, and uh, that might sort of uh, cripple his attack a bit, because I know we're going as hard as we can. Prior Bunner is the second last stage of the day. High base time and easy to clean. That's in theory. First ball, Stokel takes a detour. There you go, left wall. Yeah, coming through up there, up there. Go up there. Keep going, just keep eight right through there with the hay bales, huh? Then, Rob Sherrard. Half building. Oh, no. Straight on. Oh, no, you've missed the course, you've gone through the bunting. Then, Stuart Appleby. Where now? That was an adventure. I thought you saw the fish and chip shop and you wanted to go and pick oh, up. I think the pink car or whatever car that Subaru put me off. Yeah, no. I, uh, I looked and I, and I just laughed and I saw the dirt and I go, what the f are we doing on dirt? We're not supposed to be going dirt. The light is fading fast on Grass Tree Hill, the final stage of the day. Stokel is again quickest, seven seconds faster than those chasing. So to the Delta Hydraulics leaderboard and in the historic competition, John and Paul Lawson have maintained their lead at almost eight minutes over the Oakland 8 of John Felder. The Kents back a further minute in third. In the Shannon's Classic competition, less than 30 seconds separates the top two. Bill Pye still in front with Michael Conway chasing hard. John Siddons holds on to third place but only by three seconds to Ian Morris in fourth. The drivetravel.com modern competition has had a huge turnaround. Paul Stokel and Peter Roberts leaping from fourth to first over day two. They lead Richards and Oliver by 23 seconds. Tony Quinn and Keith Wen only four seconds further back. Stuart Appleby is up to 23rd. All in all, it's a red letter day for Lamborghini. The Touring Classic competition follows the same shorter course run by the historic cars. The combination of Steve and Terry Bruce in a 67 Mini Cooper S has pulled a one minute gap over the rest of the field by the end of day two. Running second is James Powell Davies at the wheel of a 77 BMW, while Martin Utber is third in a 61 Vauxhall Cresta, two minutes and 18 seconds off the lead. Off the gas, very well done. Welcome to Hobart. Holy moly, that was good. Target Tasmania is the state's biggest motoring prize. It's been 11 long years since a local tasted success and the natives are getting restless. Paul Stokel finished third in 99 in a Lotus Elise, but it's been lean picking since. His most infamous moment came at a bus stop on Guns Plains in 2002. Last year he was leading the classic comp in a Datsun before mechanical failure ended his event. Jason White cut his teeth on Tasmania's go-kart tracks. The V8's King Marcus Ambrose was his long-time rival and White beat the Devil Racer as often as not. He's been as high as third in Targa, disqualified out of second place last year when his car was found to be outside the rules. Jason and John White are Tasmania's version of the Dukes of Hazard. Then we've got a right five and a right four and a half down here, flat to the finish. Full noise. That's a <laughs> mate. That was smooth. 
Greg Garwood is the third serious local hope. Quick in the wet anyway, his chances are boosted with a new four-wheel drive turbo Porsche. Beneath his softly spoken demeanour lies a very determined racer. Short nine on left over crest 50. Short nine on left here, 50 metres. It's a short eight left. Short eight left here, then eight right. It's an eight right on crest, then eight left. Day three, and for the first time in the 05 event, weather looks to become a factor. Rain squalls greet competitors as they're flagged away from the official start at Salamanca. The shortest day of the event, day three, takes the field south of Hobart on a loop through the Huon and Channel districts. The total competition distance is less than 60 kilometres, but crews will drop vital seconds on each of the seven competition stages. With a driving career spanning 21 Bathurst starts, Tasmanian Scott Taylor is enjoying his first crack at target. I suppose being the first target that me and uh, Stephen Bell have ever done, I suppose we, uh, we'd like to uh, start, finish and uh, probably make sure that the car is looking in the same condition as when we, uh, when we finish the uh, target after the five or six days. Centre right through, left isn't it, left, left, yeah left, yeah left through sorry, yeah. Taylor's A9X Tirana is also a veteran of Mount Panorama and by the end of day three the old firm is running in 70th place with plenty of work to do. Now retired, Taylor spends his days working on his beloved cars. Targa's classic competition has been putting the fire back in the belly of the long time racer. You're right, mate, or not? Yeah, I got lost, but we're near the end now. The classic competition is shaping as a race in two. Bill Pye's 911 is 29 seconds ahead of Michael Conway's escort. John Siddons holds third in the Datsun 240Z, but is a minute 50 behind the leaders. Intermittent rain and slippery conditions are taking their toll on the careless. Eric Grimshaw and one of the Blue Gun escorts leaping off the Woodbridge stage and out of the event. Missed second gear coming into the corner and uh, at Angel Gear, got in the second too late and front just locked up and off the road. Everyone's all right? Yeah, everyone's fine. Jason White, however, is revelling in the wet, the four-wheel drive Nissan in its element. Right five tights to a three and a half. White quickest on four of the five morning stages to jump from fourth to second. Like a little bit of rain, you got some? Yeah, yeah, it was a, uh, a hell of a gift, um, especially in the in the real uh, the real bumpy stuff. Um, you know, like the Woodbridge and um, and Oyster Cave, all that sort of stuff. You just you know, you you just wouldn't want to be in a different vehicle. You know, she's the she's more of a rally car than a than a circuit car, if you like. So. Tony Quinn is also having a good day, but he's a little less enthusiastic. Slippery as. How'd you go? More slippery than an eel up a ladder, backwards. How'd I go? I'm still here. Very slippery. Like conditions this morning are so changeable. One minute you get a wet corner, the next minute it's dry, and it's uh, very unpredictable. It's been okay. We've had a little bit of understeer, which we expected um, because of their tie choice, but yeah, we're getting through. Paul Stokel holds a narrow 10 second lead as he sets out on the afternoon stages. Seven left that opens up into Hug Seven Right. Into short nine left. You right? Yep. Keep going. You right? Yeah, she's all over, mate. She's Take us through it, Paul. Yeah, it was, it was fairly slippery, but um, we come through a couple of sevens and it was seven right. And just uh, as, it, as I tipped in, I got really good front bite and the back just stepped out and had a nice big drift going. But um, yeah, it got away from me and then uh, basically we ended up in the bank on the other side of the road. So that was the end of the day. It's got to be so disappointing. Very disappointing, yeah. I didn't seem that bad. It wasn't that bad a corner. It was opening and uh, yeah, I don't know. Just uh, let go of the back and that was the end of it. Stokel again left wondering what might have been. It's a bitter end to a gallant challenge.
And a check of the Delta Hydraulics leaderboard reveals Jason White has been the big winner into the lead with a 27 second gap back to Tony Quinn. Jim Richards has lost ground to the leaders. He's in third, 43 seconds down. Greg Garwood has picked up two places, climbing from sixth to fourth. Bill Pye still leads in classic, but the margin is down to 12 seconds to Michael Conway. Drive of the day has come from defending champ Nick Ellis. Up five spots from eight to finish the day third. There's a shake-up in the Touring Classic top three with Martin Utler blowing a gearbox in the Vauxhall on the Oyster Cove stage. It costs plenty of time and elevates Duncan and Bronwyn Matheson in a Porsche 912 into third place. Still going strong, the leaders Bruce and Bruce in the Mini extending their lead over the second place BMW to one minute and 35 seconds. Day four of Targa begins on the outskirts of Hobart, three and a half kilometres through the Queen's Domain and Botanical Gardens. Day four is the Northwest Challenge, 10 stages and 110 kilometres of competition driving. It includes the 37 kilometre Sathana and 24 kilometre South Rayana stages, two of the longest and most challenging of the event. The historic farming village of Ross in Tasmania's heartland plays host to Targa early on day four. Crowds gather to take in the highlights of the tight and testing street stage. The day began badly for historic leader John Lawson. The Amel car has had a range of technical hiccups along the way, but this seems more serious. Clutch plate centre broke out in Colbrook. Just over a rough bit and bang it went, you know. We'll fix it. We got through the end. We've never missed a target stage and I'm not going to bloody well miss one now. The field makes its way north through the rural farm country of Tasmania, at times forced to share the roads with the resident locals. Qantas pilot and Targa rookie Guy Standard was running close to the classic top 20 at the start of the Mole Creek stage. Right. Oh, We're out. That's it. We're gone. Guy none too pleased with his performance. Modern leader Jason White had lost a couple of seconds to the chasing pack on the first four stages of the day. That blew out to ten on Mole Creek. Yeah, I reckon if it's dry, I reckon uh, I reckon Quinny and Jim could probably uh, reel us in pretty well. But if it is really grotty, you know, that's that's when we'll be hopefully be able to pull out another uh, thirty seconds or so. It'd be nice to arrive at tea tonight and uh, know we had a, a minute up the sleeve. Jim Richards is the quickest car on the road after the morning stages. Yeah, the last one was a little bit greasy, but uh, other than that, we, we sort of cleared all the other ones and we just lost some time on that one there. If it's wet, then we'll lose time, obviously. If it's dry, we've got a chance, but probably Chase is about as probably good as us on those kind of stages in the dry anyway, so we're unlikely to catch up, but uh, who knows, anything can happen. In Classic, Bill Pyers pulled out another six seconds over Michael Conway, the gap out to 18 seconds. We, th we think we're basically matched on all those morning stages, so about where we started the day, so we'll see how we go this afternoon. A few black thunderheads and bits of places up there that uh, probably puts you in good stead. Yes, don't mind the rain, so uh, we're looking forward to driving through it. Golfer Stuart Appleby is beginning to post some impressive times. His Lamborghini, the seventh fastest car around the circuit stage at Simmons Plains. And punch. Go for it. By lunch on day four, Appleby is 12th outright. Storm clouds fill the horizon as the field files away for the afternoon stages. This is Target Tasmania at its most intimidating. 
the seven right, possible gravel. 50, this is where we go like big time, baby. Very long, nine left. 100 to a crest, and then another 100. Greg Garwood is focused and on the charge, second quickest in the morning stages, but he knows only too well how unforgiving the afternoon can be. He and navigator Mark Perry rolling their Porsche several times on the guns playing stage. Probably more determined this year, but I mean, we know what happens. Uh, at the end of the day, you just got to put it in the back of your mind and don't worry about it. Garwood blitzes the Sathana stage, fastest by 10 seconds, actually catching and passing Tony Quinn. Tightens at the end. Tightens, mate. No, just tightens. Just make sure you get your grip. Go. Fantastic. Short line on left. Then a little salute for the corner that tripped him up last year. Then six left. Corner. Yeah, six left. Is this him? Yep. Weakness. Seven right, good boy. Long eight left opens. You're the champ. 150. The pressure of being chased down is beginning to tell on race leader Jason White, taking out two guide posts. So one and a half, then a left two, and then you got a piddling little straight. <laughs> left two now. Adding to the drama, a mechanical gremlin cost White time on Sathana, his Nissan without four wheel drive for much of the stage. Straight into a right three. Turned her off. What's happened? I turned her off so that it's only rear wheel drive. But hey? It's only rear wheel drive. All oh, right, left six, right five and a half. It's an unexpected bonus for Jim Richards, who catches one by the end of the stage. That's it. Jim behind us. He caught us. Uh, Two wheel drive. Uh, Country bridge three right. Elsewhere, cars are falling off the road at a rapid rate. Okay, come on. Philip Buggy parked his feet at the bottom of a six metre ravine, amazingly managing to walk away. Michael Stillwell punted a bank in his place at BMW on South Guyana. Tasmanian Greg Johnson also fell foul of the notorious South Guyana stage. Come into this left three basically and uh, I thought I'd pulled it up enough and um, jumped on the, on the gas to go up over this fairly long straight and uh, just picked up the front and went straight ahead basically. It's fairly slippery there. And, um, I was carrying a fair bit of corner speed, so game over. No one said Targa is easy. Classic leader Bill Pye has got the bit between his teeth but isn't getting the respect he deserves out on the road. Get on your horn. Keep five right and six left. The passing manoeuvre sticks, but the car comes unglued shortly after. Just here, gravel. Back her up. The news is even worse for defending classic champ Nick Ellis. His gearbox out to lunch on Sathana. What the f***? A little further up the road, on the Natone stage, one corner is causing problems for plenty of competitors. A waiting band of press and television cameras are on hand to capture the action, then the tables are turned. Cameraman Tim Williams copping the full brunt of Doug Walker's Nissan GTR. Uninjured, the cameraman dusted himself off, his lens and pride the major casualties of the accident. In Touring Classic, locals James Powell Davies and Nick McShane are on a serious charge. Both are motorsport novices, target their first competitive event, but on day four they've made up more than a minute on the leaders, now just 19 seconds behind West Australia's Steve Bruce in the mini. Duncan Matheson is third, some distance back, four minutes off the lead. 
one more day left of the rally. Um, we'll keep it on the black stuff tomorrow and uh, we'll all be down in Hobart. Well done, Stuart. You've done... Well, thank you, Mother, for the rabbits. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mother, for the rabbits. It's been a hectic four days and now just the strip of black top between Burnie and Hobart separates the remaining field from the finish. That's it, keep going, it's only five seconds. Five minutes. Fittingly, day five is the longest of the event. Nine stages and 146 kilometres of competition driving. Strawn is the longest of the morning runs at 33 kilometres. Mount Arrowsmith in the afternoon is 47 kilometres the longest stage in the event. Six of the nine stages will cost cruise time. A check of the Delta Hydraulics leaderboard at the start of day five shows in the Shannon's Classic competition, Bill Pine a Porsche with a one minute lead over Michael Conway's Escort. It's then a further two and a half minutes back to John Siddons in a Datsun 240Z. In the drivetravel.com modern comp, the four top cars are separated by a margin of only 31 seconds. It's the closest day four result in target history. Jason White leads by four seconds over Jim Richards. Tony Quinn is 18 seconds back. Greg Garwood is on a charge, 13 seconds behind Quinn. WA Steve Bruce has led the Touring Classic competition since day one. By day five, the Mini's feeling the pinch. Its clutch is completely shot. Starts have to be made with the car switched off. The mechanical problems play into the hands of James Powell Davies in the BMW, picking up another 40 seconds on the final day to make his debut performance a winning one. New South Wales duo Duncan and Bronwyn Matheson pilot their Porsche 912 home into third place. The run to the finish begins at Hellia Gorge. Intermittent showers keep the road slick. Not ideal conditions for Bill Pye's Porsche defending a one minute lead in Classic. We'll have to have a bit of a go I think. I'm sure the guys behind us will be trying hard and you know the escort's very good in the wet so we've got to keep, keep going. Michael Conway has maintained the pressure for four days and isn't about to ease the squeeze. He knows that we're pretty quick in the wet, so we'll, uh, we'll keep on keeping that pressure on him and uh, see how he responds. Jim Richards is four seconds off the modern lead, but the wet road and two-wheel drive has sapped his appetite for a fight. A any wet's a bit wet for us, but no, we're going to enjoy it and uh, see what happens down the road further. Jason White pulls to the line, knowing just how close his pursuers are. Four seconds, eh? <laughs> Yeah, she's pretty tight, but um, yeah, we'll see how we go. We um, had the boys working on the car last night trying to fix the dramas we had yesterday, but uh, the first time we tried the ABS again was just up the road and a couple of slippery bits, and there doesn't appear to be any, so she's, um, she's back into a bit of the nervous territory under brakes again. So The fastest car on the road yesterday, Greg Garwood reeled wide in by more than a minute. If he can make half that time today, he'll win. We'll just drive as fast as we possibly can, and if that's not good enough, we'll say be it. Down to left two. Now. White lands the first blow of the day, quickest by two seconds through Helia Gorge. Left at the end, 50. Garwood is second, Richards third, eight seconds back. Right, left long. This long. Goes on and on, and goes down to a medium left. Garwood is fastest over two of the next three stages, jumping from fourth to second by the lunch stop. Seven left at the end. Tony Quinn is third, seven seconds behind Garwood and driving on the ragged edge. Jim Richards' challenge is all but over, losing 37 seconds to the leaders on the morning stages. In Classic, the top three remain unchanged, Bill Pye leading from Conway. The big move has come from John Siddons in the Datsun, 25 seconds faster than anyone else through Helia Gorge and now running third. 
Nick Ellis is now out of classic contention but has the gearbox replaced and is now on fire, letting it all hang out. Since yesterday's clutch failure put John Lawson out of contention, the historic race is being fought out between Graham Kent and John Felder. Amazingly, only five seconds separates the old beasts after four and a half days of competition. Kent's 36 Ford Coupe with the slender lead. The sprint to the finish comes down to two stages, Queenstown and Taralea. They're the only ones likely to cost time. Sitting third, 24 seconds off the lead, Tony Quinn makes his final push on Queenstown. Now this is eight right over the crest. Half and rocks. Seven left tight to a five. Oh, oh keep the night. Keep. Oh, Keith. Look at that f***ing hell, man. You right, buddy? Oh, yeah. Triangles. It's the second time the laconic Scotsman has given up a podium spot on the final day. Get a good line, past six left here. Greg Galwood clocks the quickest time on Queenstown, cutting the margin between himself and Jason White to nine seconds with one stage to run. Crest into care, eight wide, 50 metres. With three stages to run, Barry Brooks and the Dado takes to some logging operations in the Tasmanian forests. It's a cruel end to Bill Pye's event after leading classics since day one, he slapped with a 10 minute penalty for speeding through a control stage. Rookie Victorian Michael Conway canters home for a rare first up win. Very happy with that. Um, kept some pressure on today and they've made some sort of mistake and uh, we got first place. John Siddons and Graham Copeland and Jackson take second, with Ian Morris and an Alfa Romeo getting home third. Graham and Pat Kent hold on for victory in the historic competition. John Felder takes second, with John Lawson recovering from his mechanical misfortunes to place third. Back at Taralea, Greg Garwood takes his final shot. 10 left, then 9 to right, then 10 left. Recording a time of 3 minutes 29 seconds. Jason White needs to complete the stage inside 3.37 to win the event. Full noise down to the finish. Beautiful. You won't, won't complain about that. White stops the clock at 3.32 the first Tasmanian driver since 1993 to take Targa's Premier Prize. I can't wait to sit down on the couch and uh, have a couple of beers and watch all that in-car and relive a few of the moments. There are a couple of hairy ones, and especially when we were airborne in Ryanna and uh, I didn't think she was ever come down, let alone, uh, let alone uh, landing time to hit the brakes and get to the next corner. But um, no, it's, uh, it's one of the ones that we're going to remember for a long while. Greg Garwood's charge has fallen a mere six seconds short. The finish brings a mix of emotions. It's just great to finish second to Jason. Two Tasmanians, you know, the caliber of Jim Richards and that. Great effort on Jason's behalf. And obviously we've done pretty well, so pretty happy. Jim Richards has held on for third. The seven-time winner promising to be back bigger and better next year. The last two years we've decided to run two-wheel drive cars and. Um, and hoping for a bit better weather both years, but it didn't happen, so we'll go back to four-wheel drive next year. Back to four-wheel drive and back again? Oh, for sure, yeah, we'll keep going back till we can't hop in a car. Remarkably, Stuart Appleby has made his way into a top ten finish, one minute behind the celebrated Tony Longhurst. It's a spectacular result. We're really pumped about that because we, we started out in prologue, I was extremely nervous and never really driven the car like that. I mean, everything was just rushing up on me, so much information I was trying to learn. Of the 252 crews that started the event, 205 made it to the end. And to a person, the finish line conversation is the same. How will we do it better next year? Uh, <laughs> you had some fun then. <laughs>